I wanted to start with, uh, we had a discussion yesterday, change, non-change, non uh, contentious debate. Uh, this is a sign of uh, Brooks, Maine in the 1920s. Uh, they uh, already very much, almost 100 years ago, had a strong anti-chain movement uh, because chains were growing very much uh, almost 100 years ago. Think of A&P, right, Atlantic Pacific, the tea company, Woolworths. And uh, people were up in arms saying this is the worst thing that ever happened. And they actually eventually managed to convince the federal government to, uh, to have an anti-chain act, uh, the Robinson-Patman Act of 1936. There's a lot of contentious debate. Uh, uh, most scholars seem to agree that the act was actually counterproductive. It had certain uh, price capping mechanisms that chains can undercut uh, independent stores. And uh, well, uh, if you look at uh, American cities today, it didn't seem to do very much. Um, just a little aside there. The evils of Amazon, I won't go into that too much. Uh, I have a presentation where it actually has sort of an evil grin. Uh, it, it kills our toy stores. That's never a good thing. Um, in fact, it actually kills uh, every store, right? We've seen this sort of the graphs of the retail apocalypse. This was a Bloomberg article about a year ago uh, talking about how now cumulative store closings are higher than cumulative store openings. There's a couple of things I'd like to mention aside from that. This is, uh, you know, we're over retail is always the point, right? Uh, 23.6 square foot. Um, always keep in mind who pr provides your data. In this case, it's the International Council of Shopping Centers that provides it. So uh, the actual number of retail square footage per person is probably more likely to be 40 square foot because they do not count anything that's not inside a shopping mall. So if you think it was bad, it's actually worse. Um, the other thing is they, they, they tend to uh, flail and panic about you know, uh, chain stores going out of business. That's fine with me. This was a very quick exercise I did one evening when I was bored on um, the number of retail establishments per capita. And guess what? They've been going down forever because we're looking at fewer larger retail establishments. The reason I say it's at night because you see jogs, that's because I had to use several different data sets for this. So uh, there's certainly, I think Luke has left a room, but uh, we need to have a conversation <laughs> about uh, some methodology about this. But just know that this is a pattern that's been ongoing and it's a very suburban pattern, right? This retail apocalypse, why do people start caring now is because it happens to your favorite suburban retail chain if you think about it, in the US, in cities, this has been happening forever. And that's what I would like to talk to you about today, is patterns of urban retail decline. Here's a picture from the Netherlands, and here's a picture from the US, could be anywhere, right? Essentially, my view on this suburban retail decline is we can actually learn a lot from a pattern that's been happening quite a lot. And why? Because I think we lack a significant amount of knowledge, which has to do with the fact that we've lost a tradition of retail research, which up to about the 1950s was a very spatial branch. I'll have to uh, apologize myself. I have a spatial background, architecture, urban design, so perhaps I'm preaching to my own choir here. But you know, imagine there used to be the Nierenstein Mapping Company that had maps of stores in every American city but they kind of shut shop in the mid-1950s after they found that no one really cares about what they did anymore. No one bought their stuff. Um, still, British retail research has been ongoing about the spatial patterns of retail. What are the spatial patterns of retail success? Um, you know, they cluster, they benefit from clustering, they cluster along highly connected streets. All these types of things that we have lost in our research agenda in the United States that are still very much ongoing overseas. Instead, we do this in America. Sorry, yes, I know Heather was going to say blah, because uh, this is the Esri Tapestry. This, by the way, is worldwide, right? How does a retailer decide to locate somewhere? It's not because it's on that nice corner in this nice building. No, it's because the general demographics of this area neatly fit into one of these I think it's 67 categories, and if they fit just the right category that I'm going to locate, and we just heard yesterday in Alderman, if those categories go away and you're target, then you say, eh, I'm out of here. Because you're not spatial. You're essentially running the city by Excel sheets. If we want to reconquer those Excel sheets, we need to get back to space, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. 
essentially, can we find how retail has changed over the period of a century in this case, and especially how it has declined? And does this decline follow certain patterns that we could think about in terms of trends? Why this? Why is this so important? This is a product by a Dutch company, Locatus, and they map out for cities the retail risk index. This is RRI, retail risk index. Essentially, for each of these plots, they say, what is the risk that this building will shut down at some point? Um, and that is a tremendously valuable product. People pay thousands and thousands of dollars, cities included, on, OK, this is a street that is a very high risk of suffering further retail decline. Their risk index is, is defined by all sorts of different measures, not so much spatial, but you know, prior, prior closures. But just know that people are dying for this type of knowledge. Is do we know where shops are likely to decline? How do you do that over a 100 year period of time? You start out with some historical mapping, in the case of the US, so mostly you know, bring you to Sanborn mapping. Uh, you draw out the buildings. And then here's where it gets real fun, is you combine those with telephone directories, business directories. I hate sleeping at night, so I thought <laughs> I would just do this. Uh, luckily now, since I've worked at the University of Cincinnati and with very generous support from the Axon Johnson Foundation and uh, the KTH Center for the Future of Places, also uh, have assistants that have now lost sleep on doing this type <laughs> of stuff. Because essentially what you can do is you can put the ground floor use of every building within a certain defined space. And as a result, you find out in this sort of dark red color here where retailers are located. These books are everywhere. In fact, they're ubiquitous enough that today I would like to talk about four different case studies where I did find these books in various places. Books can also be government records and tax rolls. And you know, I'm trying to simplify the story here. But you can combine a building and what was inside that building over a period of time, as long as you don't. Uh, you know, you don't value sleep and you have enough time. So in this case, it's uh, Birmingham, England, The Hague in the Netherlands, Detroit in Michigan in the US, and Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And specifically looking at cities that at first sight seem incredibly dichotomous. You know, there's this, why would you pick four cities uh, here? Um, think about Detroit had a tremendous amount of decline. Here's sort of your average picture. Uh, the Hague, very cute Dutch town that has restaurants, bars, everyone's happy. They, they won awards for best inner city, which is what they call their downtown, best inner city uh, of the year a few years ago. Uh, Detroit, uh, sort of a, a hallmark for urban decline, although of course they are coming back. Uh, Vancouver is tremendous growth. And then Birmingham certainly struggling with their urban renewal uh, and also decline as well. The reason is essentially there are two European cities, one as a sort of a positive example, uh, one as a negative example. And in North America, it's the same thing. You have Detroit, Michigan, which is known for steep decline, and Vancouver, which is known for growth. The funny thing is that all but Vancouver, each of these downtowns, which I've actually mapped out here, uh, have suffered tremendous retail decline. So even an area that wins awards for being the most vibrant retail core has lost 50% of their retailers since 1911. Um, so we are looking at sort of cross-cultural patterns of retail chain, change. So here's what this looks like. So here's, again, these sort of outlines of downtowns. These are to the same uh, scale. What you tend to see in all of these four cities are a solid core of usually department stores, right? In 1911, the department store is very much alive. And then you get these sort of radial retail patterns of essentially neighborhoods serving retail streets, right? A lot of people living in these neighborhoods, uh, mostly located along the most central streets of a city. That's a very similar pattern you see everywhere. Um, forgot to mention here, by the way, for just for reference, The Hague, Detroit, Birmingham, Vancouver. I think it does say on your, uh, on your handout. So I'd like to take you through what this looks like in roughly 25 year intervals uh, for these four cities. So this is 1911. That teeny tiny number here is uh, at least a current approximation of the number of shops there. There's some methodological issues there. But um, just kind of look at those numbers, either go 
up or down, and witness how they go up and down. So 1911, 1937. So sometimes I can go back. So what you tend to see is, for instance, in Detroit, is the core stays very vibrant, but you get these uh, peripheral streets where a lot of retailers go out of business. That's partially because neighborhoods are in decline, but partially because the total number of retailers shrink and they tend to stick around in the best locations, very much similar uh, to Birmingham. Why is your Vancouver map missing for that one? There's some uh, minor issues with that one, so uh, I didn't feel very confident putting that one on the, on the sheet. Um, 1961, essentially you see a similar pattern where all of a sudden, you know, this used to be a full retail street in 1911, 50 years later, there's almost nothing left. I'll have to be very honest, that's usually when the planners came in. They said, oh, you know, this area is blighted. I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with that term, this area is blighted. Uh, we'll, we're going to fix it. Uh, by the time that uh, people say we're going to fix it, was when you really should be worried. In the case of Birmingham, for instance, they, they drew an urban motorway right through the middle of their city center. Uh, interestingly enough, this was considered a, a socialist project to help the workers get to their downtown. In the case of New York, or sorry, of Detroit, they drew an urban motorway through uh, the, the downtown, and that was very much a capitalist project to make sure the businesses stayed alive. So it's funny how form stays the same, it's just your story uh, changes, right? Then look at 1988 is where things really get dicey. In the case of Detroit, you know, they were spiraling out of control, right? We had 1967 civil disorders. So essentially all pattern vanishes. It's everything shuts down, right? It's where the lights go off. In the case of Birmingham is when all their urban renewal plans finalized. So they had a solid core surrounded by an urban motorway and then nothing else because they closed everything else. So everything outside of that core is like Detroit, just shut down. The same, though, goes for a city like The Hague, where they had massive urban renewal projects on the edges and said retail is not a part of this. We are not interested in this. Plus, the carrying capacity of these retailers declined, so there was no demand for these retailers as well. Why do I keep not mentioning Vancouver? Because Vancouver is actually growing really rapidly. So you've probably noticed if you looked at the bottom left of the slide is actually that was a pattern of constant growth. And here's where it gets interesting. Between 2011 and 2017, essentially, some of these, the Hague, Detroit's 2011, Vancouver, Birmingham, 2017, is some cities really took the bull by the horns. They said, this is not a pattern that we want to continue into, not a road we want to go down. In the case of the Hague, the Hague, they had massive reinvestment in their downtown area, tried to bring back retail structures, which was only partially successful. Those peripheral streets still weren't very functional. In the case of Vancouver, because of the massive extra density that came up, so many more people, it was very successful. They opened entire new areas. Think of Yale Town, for example, right? all these, these hip uh, bars and restaurants. In the case of Birmingham, they, they broke down part of that urban motorway and tried to expand their inner city or their city center in English, I guess, uh, outside of that as well. So what do you do with this? I mean, they make for, fu for, fu for fun maps, you know, pretty maps. But what do you get out of this analysis? Is after looking at these maps, I thought, OK, there's certain patterns that seem fairly consistent uh, along these lines. And this is very much work in progress, so bear with me here, is what I started to find is it's mostly retailers in the periphery of a downtown that seem to close down first. So what if we take the main corner of a downtown, or the 100% corner as it's called, or the A1 corner, depending again on which country you're in, this is multicultural study, and can we map out the rate of retail closure as a function of the distance from that main corner. That is, first of all, um, by overlaying these maps, I mapped out which of these shops actually closed between two periods of time, and then uh, start to plot them out as a result of that, uh, you know, the distance from the main corner. This is just, again, very preliminary stuff, is if you are closest to the uh, main corner, it's almost a perfect correlation. This is actually in The Hague. There's a secondary retail center further out that's still in the catchment area. If you catch this off, 
You know, that's almost a straight line of buckets from your main corner. So essentially what this says is the further you are away from the center of a downtown, the higher your risk is of closing uh, over this period of time, over a hundred year period of time. The same goes for Birmingham. Again, here is you know, a secondary center that came in. So that was one thing uh, that I'm currently working on with a colleague economist at my department uh, to, uh, to work through. Another thing that I'd quickly like to share with you, kind of taking and keeping an eye on the time here as well, is uh, the connectivity of streets. I can't go through this in depth. Uh, perhaps uh, Folly will later, I don't know, but um, this is using space syntax methodology, which uh, measures the connectivity value of streets or any type of value of streets. In this, in this case, what you see here are maps of Detroit. These models were built for the entire city over each period of time, so 1911, 37, 61, 88, etc., etc. And the darker red a color is, the more likely, this is a comp computational model, the more likely this street is used as a through route from one street to the other. So essentially, it's a proxy for the amount of people on that street. So can I now prove that the likelihood of a store closing is also if that store is on a very little traveled street? The answer is yes, pretty much. Is over a hundred year period of time, if you think about, for instance, The Hague, it goes the other way around. These are the most well-connected streets with the highest value of, of choice in this case. The technical term is choice value. Um, yes, you get an, incre an incredibly high correlation uh, uh, of, you know, your store is much less likely to close if it's along a well-traveled street. And the same goes for Detroit. In the case of Birmingham, there's too much planning going on. I'll just have to be very honest. Planners just messed up the street network to no end, which made, made, made sure that streets that had a lot of shops on them all of a sudden led to absolutely nowhere, uh, which eventually killed off all the shops. But let's just say uh, Birmingham was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and an R square of uh, point nothing just don't, doesn't really do very much. Um, but we're, you know, we're on to something here for sure. Essentially what this means, in short, is if your store is further out of the main corner of town and on a poorly located street, I can promise you that the risk of closing it is going to be much higher. These are models that can be replicated across the world. In fact, I've replicated them across the world. Another thing is, uh, very quickly here, is it's a very detailed data set. So I was also able to measure the propensity of a store closing or the chance of a store closing as a function of the number of surrounding stores. In basic uh, neoclassical retail uh, models, uh, you know, uh, retailers benefit from agglomeration, right? If you have a couple of shops, you're more likely to survive together because people walk between them. And this again was a, a, a wonderful correlation between these. In both cases, this was The Hague and Detroit, where yes, the more stores surround your store, the more likely you are to survive over a 100 year period of time. So by the time that your cluster starts dissolving, as a city, as a planner, or as a retailer, you need to jump into action because it's, it spirals. All of these things, by the way, are self-reinforcing patterns. Things spiral uh, because, of this, because of these patterns. Uh, well, very quickly then, I know I'm over time here. Path forward is, you know, by measuring also the types of retailers, this is a common sort of four type uh, categorization of retail, which is daily goods, uh, comparison shopping, non-daily like hardware services, and then bars and restaurants. Consistently what always came up is the only category that isn't shrinking as much are bars and restaurants, right? So this is sort of the, uh, the experience economy. Um, I'm sure others will, will, will talk about it. What I always find fascinating is the graph to the left is uh, a, a federal statistics on, I think it was 2015 was the first year that Americans spent more on their food in bars and restaurants than at uh, grocery stores, right? So they spend more money eating somewhere, experiencing something. Also uh, look about the, uh, the numbers of jobs created in bars and restaurants. Um, we're now approaching job levels of manufacturing at this point in the bar and restaurant industry. 
Uh, somehow we don't seem to have a president that uh, represents the bar and restaurant workers, but you know, who knows what was it 2020 will bring. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I know a lot, a lot to handle. All right. Thanks. <laughs>